Our guest today is Lou Barlow, who you probably know from Dinosaur Jr., Sebado, Folk Implosion, Deluxe Folk Implosion. Am I missing anything? I don't know. I got lost. Part Bjorn Borg, part Bill Ward, right, from Black Sabbath? <laughs> Who's your main inspiration for the headband? Probably Bjorn Borg. That's a good one. Really? Yeah, I just don't, I can't really, I can't do the shorts. <laughs> but yeah, Bjorn Borg, he would, he would. Oh, no, I know. Stephen Piercy of Rat. I'll check my headband and be like, whoa, I'm almost at Stephen Piercy level with this headband today. What do you do for your first hour of work every day? Does that include like desperate emails to lawyers and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> when you get a royalty check, it's it's itemized and says what song indeed is you're being paid out for. So is it is Natural One the one that you are still seeing the most windfall from? Yeah, probably. You know, I mean, it, it, but even then, it's it's kind of funny. It doesn't amount to like you know ninety percent of it or anything. It's like I just I have a lot of songs and they all kind of add up. The, the basic royalties that I get, somehow those are always the same. I don't know why my BMI checks have been so incredibly consistent for 25 years. That's but wild. It is wild. I mean, they're not they're not uh, large, but they're but they are consistent. But like I said, it's all very modest, you know. Now that we're talking about money a little bit, when I saw you perform, you <laughs> relate a story about when you split ways with Dinosaur Junior. and you got a check for 10 grand. Yeah. And, thinking about that it surprised me i was like wow good for them for setting lou up with something yeah i mean we sold i mean you have to realize like, like back in the 80s there was record there was actual record sales i mean if you were successful you would sell between 50 and 100,000 copies domestically it gave me a little nest egg that got me over my over the bump between not being a dinosaur junior and, and getting my other things off the ground you know what's the most expensive equipment you've ever invested in pro tools digi 001 setup in my mac tower and my screen you know what would have been different if those first sebado records were on pro tools it would have been amazing <laughs> The word lo-fi would have never been thrown around, right? I, don't know. I wouldn't say that necessarily. We would have, I would have still done pretty raw recordings, and I would have used cassette, and I would have, I would have just made it absolutely overwhelming. I thought the 2000s were a really cool period of music because I thought that was really when bands were really embracing home recording because of digital things, and there were bands like Grizzly Bear, Animal Collective, a lot of bands in the 2000s that were. You know, categorized as indie bands were actually producing their own music like death cab for cutie and what an incredible leap in quality the music made in the two i mean indie music as as i understood it to be made in, in the 2000s because basically you would have like the drummer or the bass player engineering the recordings for these bands i was jealous of that because i was like oh, i had to live through the 90s which was like the worst time to be in a studio as far as i could tell people sort of fetishized the 90s, you know, but you had to basically channel everything through somebody who could operate a 20, you know, a 24 track reel to reel machine, you know, and they would, you would just say, well, can you just make it sound like this? And they'd be like, uh, and then they'd be putting triggers on the drums. And then you'd be like, can't we just use the room sound mics? And they like, no, we cannot use the room sound. <laughs> a lot of records in the 90s sound like absolute garbage, like rock records anyway. I don't like I don't like the way they sound. I, w I wished I had just stuck to four track. Yeah. <laughs> what I did initially was take my four track in and say like, here's my four track recordings. And they'd be like, great, you know, so you wanna, these are demos. I'm like, no, they're not demos. We're gonna run the four track through this board. And that's what the record's going to be. And I had great results that way. But People, So you don't like the sounds of those records now? Absolutely not. And in the 90s, too, there was a, I, I just this bizarre compulsion to bury the vocals that I still don't understand. I'm just like, why did we do that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand why you, like, why is the guitar the loudest thing in the mix? It's the most annoying. I mean, like, why, why can't everything just sound like a 60s record? If we're doing, right. Why can't you make the guitar sound like, like, I don't know, Pete Townsend's guitar. Why is that so goddamn difficult? It's like the clean guitar through a, a, a Vox amp. These are very simple things that these people did in the 60s. Why is it, why do they sound, not just, and it's not just the playing. I mean, the playing, of course, is a huge part of it, but it's like, but why, you know, why were these, these basically elemental recordings that sound have full fidelity to them. Why is that so difficult to recapture? This is, it's called Quiz 500 and it's 500 music questions and We'll, we'll do them till you get one wrong, all right? Oh, oh you, got you, you ready? All right, yeah. On um, what instrument would you find machine heads? Guitars and basses. Who were the Fab Four? The Beatles. Name the lead singer of Yes. Oh, 
see, these are things I don't, it's not that I don't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him. I can hear him in my head. I don't know. I don't know. John Anderson. John Anderson. I love that on your most recent album, you're finishing songs you began at the age of 13. And I, there's actually more where that came from. I think what I like most about that is like, I think the best music is made through collaboration. And a collaboration is such an intimate and personal process that uh, it's really difficult to have that kind of a relationship with people where you can truly collaborate in a way that you need to make extraordinary music. You know, I mean, I've had it a few times with a few people, but I collaborate with my son. <laughs> like that kind, of distance, that kind of distance in years is like the only thing that really truly uh, resembles how it is to, to, to collaborate with another person because myself as a 13 year old was an entirely different person. These songs that you did revisit, were they still swimming in your head as well? No, no these are all things like if I go back to them, it's not like I, I listen to something and say, wow, that was good. And it's like, I've never forgotten about it. Yeah, that's like, terrific. I have a pretty, I have a pretty patchy memory for things. Like I can't remember like, you know, the streets of my hometown when I was, you know, 13 or 14 but I can remember like melodies that I came up with back then that for some reason will come back to me randomly. Like they just visit me. They, they're just like these little ghosts that come back every once in a while. Like, oh yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that in a while. You know I mean? It's just funny how it happens. Well, it's good to see you again, Lou. Thanks for being here. Well, um, where did, where did we meet before? Oh, I was in the uh, video for Ocean by your band Sebado. Okay. Were you like in the audience and you, you were in the audience? Yeah, okay. I, was, I was this guy. Oh, it's the guy who was like this. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about, it's about a minute 10 into the video or something like that, right? It's like just yep. after I'm rolling around and then there's a crowd shot and then it's, there's you. Everybody in that video did a great job, and, but you were memorable. To say Thank the you. Least. <laughs> right back at you. 